everything about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning. You're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. Well, we're back in action after a midweek holiday yesterday and there's lots to tell you about. I'm going to start with the headlines. First up, Asian markets have opened mixed, some for the first time this week as investors assess a stronger dollar and a strong performance from Apple. Automakers continue to cruise in April as almost all car and commercial vehicle manufacturers report double-digit growth. Indigo won't miss a heartbeat, making a transition from Aditya Ghosh to the president in waiting. Gregory Taylor says co-founder Rahul Bhatia, he reiterates that there will be no animosity with Ghosh. And LNT sells its electrical and automation business to Schneider Electric for 14,000 crore rupees. With that, let's turn to the US markets now. Wall Street saw a mixed close during Tuesday's trading session while Apple uh, le uh, ha had uh, the gains, uh, mostly led the gains. Uh, they were somewhat offset by a drop in industrial metals. Abigail Doolittle has this report. Stocks finished widely mixed in Tuesday's Wall Street session with the Dow finishing down by just three tenths of one percent. And I say by just because at the lows, the Dow had been down one and a half percent. This is the S&P 500 finished up one quarter of one percent. The tech heavy Nasdaq finishing higher by about nine tenths of one percent. So clearly with the Nasdaq outperforming by such a wide degree, tech, that was the top sector on the day, up about one and a half percent. Lots of the big names driving that strength, including Apple, up more than two percent ahead of the company's quarterly earnings report, but also names such as Alphabet, Microsoft, Intel, many others really helping to drive that strength. Plus, Facebook. At the lows, Facebook had been down about 1%, but after CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced the fact that the company is going to be featuring a new dating uh, feature on its platform, uh, those shares rallied, finishing higher by more than 1%. Match Group, though, down more than 20%. It's worst day ever on the news of that competition. Now, there was also a lot of strength for the tech sector uh, coming from chips. Chips up uh, more than 1%, really outperforming, being helped by a number of the Apple suppliers, including Corvo, Sirius Logic, among others, uh, suggesting that investors uh, think those results will come through strong, as was proven true uh, in the post market news. Apple results really did exceed estimates, and those shares are trading higher at this time ahead of the conference call again in the post market news. And we go cross asset class. The Bloomberg dollar index up more than six tenths of one percent, some real strength following April strength, where it was up more than two percent. And with Haven bonds trading lower in the day, the Bloomberg dollar index higher, plus stocks finishing mixed, but with more of a bullish bent. Tuesday's Wall Street session ended with a sense of risk on. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. All right, and it seems that that similar tone is uh, taking over the Asian markets as well. Some of them have opened for the first time, like I told you earlier uh, today. They were closed on both Monday and yesterday. Uh, the Jap Japanese Nikkei is down about uh, two-tenths of a percent. And uh, the Australian benchmark is actually trading in the green, but South Korea is trading red. We'll have to see how China opens just a short while from now. Now, a good deal of focus uh, will likely be on trade talks between the U.S. and China that will begin when a delegation of the U.S. meets Chinese officials tomorrow. Now, in the run-up to that meeting, U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross has said that though China talks about free trade, their behavior is more protectionist than the U.S. Listen in. Forced technology transfers, forced uh, joint venture agreements, theft of intellectual property, cyber breaches, Artificial barriers to trade in the form of standards, regulatory approvals, high tariff barriers. China, as you probably know, talks a lot about free trade, but in fact their behavior is highly protectionist, much more protectionist than the U.S. Now, sticking with news on the U.S., U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has spoken about global sanctions, especially the ones on Russia's United Core Rusal. 
He says the objective wasn't to put Rusal out of business. We've had a very broad sanctions program against Russia for the last year uh, under our, our Ukraine sanctions program. Uh, Congress passed the CATSA law, overwhelming amount. Under that, we had to write the report on the oligarchs and the political figures. We had a both classified and unclassified report. We went through a very long process. Uh, Rusal was picked up, not because we were targeting Rusal, but because we were targeting the ownership of Rusal. So, we, you know, we, we understood the impact that this would have on a lot of hard workers there. We've extended the the license with Rusal to try to deal with these issues. The company has petitioned us for delisting. And I'm not going to comment on the specifics of what that would entail, but one of the issues will be uh, selling down the majority interest. There's lots of facts and circumstances that we're discussing. The first aspect would be that he sells down below 50 percent. And again, we're having, we're having conversations with the, the company. Obviously, we found those discussions encouraging, and that's why we extended the license, to allow the company to have time and us to have time to deal with these issues. Our objective was not to put Rusal out of business, and that's why we extended the license. All right. That uh, sanction a little while back had a huge bearing on aluminum prices as well. But with that, let's turn to Darshan Mehta for the trade setup for the day in India. He's also going to tell you all about the futures and options space. Darshan, first, with regard to the trade setup, the SGX Nifty is indicating a bit of a downtick. Yeah, so 14 points down is something that the SCX Nifty is indicating at this point of time. But remember, we were shut yesterday and the SCX Nifty was down another 25 points. So expect a 35, uh, close to a 40 point downtick as far as our markets are concerned when they open in trade. Now, if you're looking at what happened with the ADRs, most of the ADRs ended with a negative pass. ICICI was down close to 8 tenths of percent. Vedanta was down. Dr. Eddies and Wipro were down in trade. So this was what happened as far as the ADRs are concerned. The other ADRs, Tata Motors managed to rally up 1%. HDFC Bank was rather flat in trade. Now, crude was down over 2% in overnight trade, but in morning trade has managed to pick up. But nevertheless, WTI is at 67 and Brent has moved up to levels of almost 73 now. As far as the base metals on the LME is concerned, it was a mixed closing. Some of them had seen negative sell, sell flows that came out. So you could see that copper, zinc were down in trade. Uh, bled again, so selling that came in, that was there. Aluminium was the only one that was rather stable in trade. What's happening with the base metals in China? Aluminium has managed to open on the higher side. Look at steel in China. It's up almost 2% at this point of time. Copper and zinc have managed to end open with a negative bias currently. As far as the precious metals are concerned, all of them are trading with a positive bias. Let's see what happened with the fund flows on uh, Monday. Uh, so FI has bought in almost, uh, sold in almost 385 crores in the cash market. DIs were net bias to the tune of almost uh, 261 crores in the cash market. Now, mainly some of the sectors in focus, the India WIX managed to inch up since the market was a little volatile. The mid caps and small cap did manage to move in much higher in trade. Some of the sectors in focus, the PSU banking index was up 1.7%. The real estate index was up almost 1.6% in trade. Overall, the energy index was down almost 2%, and this was mainly led by the drop in Reliance Industries. Overall, the Nifty was up almost 47 points. The HDFC twins, Kotak, uh, post the numbers, and TCS managed to inch up. What didn't do well was the private sector banks, Reliance and UPL, which were down in trade. But overall, uh, close to the 10,750 mark on the Nifty. Today, expect some bit of selling pressure that will come in. All right, and with regard to the future and option space, uh, what are the numbers and what are the levels we're looking at? Yeah, so basically, if you're looking at the Nifty futures itself, there was fresh buying that was seen. Open interest built up was just 2% on the Nifty. Let's take a look at the Nifty Bank and we'll come to see what's happening there. That one's a short covering that came in. Open interest was down. Almost, open interest was down. 3.5% on the Nifty Bank. Now, if you're looking at uh, the Nifty PCR, PCR has been pretty much at the same level since the Nifty hasn't moved very, very significantly. So at 1.52. Now, what happened uh, in uh, what we're seeing as far as open interest buildup is concerned, uh, from levels of 10,700 to 10,000, from 10,700 to higher levels, uh, you know, call writers are becoming active. So they expect the market to come down. But put writers are active from levels of 10,400 right up to 10,700. So mature majority of the action will happen between the 10,600 to 10,800 mark in trade. Let's see what happened. 
in terms of the open interest change, so put writers became active on uh, Monday. They wrote in from levels of 10,600 to 10,800, and call writers are active at levels of 11,000 in trade currently. So it's it's a very broad range. It's not giving any kind of indication where the market is moving, but it's giving more of a broad range. PC Jewelers was down 20%. It enters the FNO band, so this is the only counter in the FNO band. IRB Infra saw buying on high open interest buildup of 17%. The other stock that was in focus was KPIT Tech. Again, high open interest buildup of almost 15% on the long side. Uh, you also had counters like PC Dwellers with saw fresh shots on open interest buildup of uh, 36%. And you had Canfin Homes with saw fresh shots on the open interest buildup of 14% in trade. All right, thanks so much for that, Darshan. Let's move on now and talk about uh, commodities. But before we, we do, we just have to point out that the rupee and the bond market will open for the first time this week. And there's a lot to talk about in those two markets. We will, over the course of the day, be looking at those two rates. Remember, the short-term rates will be what you have to watch out for in the bond market because of the changes that were brought about by the Reserve Bank of India in uh, the FII holding limits therein. But right now, let's move on and talk about the commodity space. Jesh Kilnani has all the updates in that market. Jesh, over to you. Morning, Alex. Uh, so what is uh, impacting the commodities market uh, as a whole is the dollar index, which has, in fact, uh, spiked and uh, you know gained more than 1% uh, for this week. So on account of that, the entire commodity basket did actually see a downtake as far as overnight rates are concerned. Uh, starting off with oil prices, Darshan was mentioning that uh, uh, both WTI and uh, Brent declined as much as 2% overnight on account of uh, gain in the dollar index and a supply gain that we are expecting. Uh, so the U.S. crude oil inventory is likely to rise as much as uh, 3.4 million barrels for last week as per and uh, as per epi data now as far as uh, the uh, base metal space is concerned most of the base metals in fact uh, declined on the london metal exchange uh, led by zinc which was down 2% uh, now uh, as far as other base metals are concerned uh, the aluminum inventory declined uh, as much as 1.2% that was the most in a year that we got uh, while uh, we have we have a report from moody's which says that uh, copper and nickel shortfalls uh, may slow down the battery boom that we are seeing and on account of that lead decline more than 1% in trade and uh, like I was mentioning aluminium and tin close positive now if you look at the Shanghai futures exchange uh, the base metals are in fact trading uh, with a mixed bias uh, with the Shanghai steel that is up more than 2% in trade so watch out for that one as well as far as the precious metals are concerned uh, we saw a dip in the gold prices uh, to the tune of about 1% and it managed to touch a one month low uh, once again on the dollar index which actually surged uh, one percent so far this week all right thanks for that jesh let's move on now and talk about tax in fact gst tax collections have arisen in april to over one lakh crore rupees and they've crossed that mark for the first time since the new tax regime was rolled out in july last year nikunj Ori is on the phone line this morning uh, telling us about the breakup nikunj how we reached that number and and it's it's a pretty important number just uh, in terms of reaching that one lakh crore mark uh, right. The GST collections in April have crossed the 1 lakh crore mark for the first time since the goods and services tax was implemented in India since July. The GST, the gross tax collected in uh, April was 1.03 lakh crore and uh, GST collected under various heads was as follows. Central goods and services tax collected during the same period was about 18,652 crore, while SGST was state goods and services tax was 25,000. 704 crore rupees. IGST and compensation says was about 50,548 crore and 8,554 crore rupees respectively. Now what the government has said that this shouldn't be, uh, the reason for this inflated number is that taxpayers generally tend to pay up their dues when the financial year ends and this shouldn't be used as a trend for future comparisons. However, there's, uh, there's another good news for the government that the number of return filers has increased by a lakh as compared to the previous month. There were about 60 .60 lakh, uh, uh, 47,000 uh, lakh taxpayers. Uh, GSTR-3B returns that were filed in April as compared to 59 lakh, 51 lakh, 59 lakh GSTR-3B returns filed in February. Over to you. All right. Thanks so much for that, Nikunj. Well, we'll stick with that story and come back to it over the course of the day. But clearly, what Nikunj is saying is that you shouldn't treat that as the benchmark or the new norm. 
Uh, well, let's move on now. The government has managed to end FY18 with a fiscal deficit of 3.4% of GDP, according to DEA Secretary Subhash Chandra Garg. Speaking to Ira Dugal, Garg lists out the factors behind the government managing to meet its revised target of 3.5% in the financial year ending March 2018. Listen in. We have ended uh, the year with about 3.4 percent, rather, rather than 3.5 percent. So we have done better than uh, the RE numbers of 3.5. The final numbers are 3.4. Is that is that on the back uh, of partly uh, an interim dividend from the Reserve Bank of India, and how much is that, sir? No, I think it, it is all across. The taxes did very well. Um, the uh, direct taxes more or less were 100%. Uh, so uh, dividend also came in from uh, RBI, the interim dividend. Uh, there was some expenditure uh, um, shortfall uh, at the end. But the net result of all, all this was uh, that uh, I think we, we could do about 98 point some percent of the budget outturn and finally the um, the fiscal deficit was 3.4 percent. Uh, the deficit, uh, the dividend that came in, sir, was 10,000 crore from the RBI. That's correct. Okay, uh, sir, we yes. also we also believe that there was some uh, you know sort of write back for the want of a better word of capex that had been allotted to uh, the railways which didn't get used. Uh, so that has got that has also helped uh, meet the goal, sir. Yes, there was some uh, some lesser spend uh, on the railway side. They met probably from other sources uh, and from the um, fiscal side, there was lesser than what was budgeted even at the RE stay. So uh, that must have marginally also contributed. Uh, good news for the economy there. Remember, the final numbers are not yet out, but well, it seems like they're meeting the target on fiscal deficit. Let's move on now. It's the start of the month and it's that time when Indian automakers report their numbers and it seems that they've begun the new year with a strong set of numbers in April, continuing the momentum that they saw in March when all companies reported double-digit sales growth. Now, the country's largest car maker, Maruti Suzuki, saw its sales rise for a 14th straight month driven by demand for its compact cars. India's largest commercial vehicle manufacturer, Tata Motors, also saw sales nearly double over the same month last year. While Maruti sales grew 14.4% over the previous year, Tata Motors sold 86% more vehicles compared to last year, driven by both commercial and passenger vehicles. Mahindra's sales rose 22%. Tractor sales saw an 18% increase over the same period last year. And Ashok Leyland, Hero Motor Corp and Bajaj Auto will all report their numbers uh, later today. Hero Motor Corp, of course, will also report its fourth quarter earnings today and it's expected to report a strong quarter. Just talking about the headline numbers, net profit is expected to rise 33% on a year-on-year -year basis and revenues are expected to rise 23%. All right, let's move on to the aviation space now. From Pratt & Whitney, that's the engines, to the stepping down of its president, Interglobe Aviation has had its share of being in the news in the past few months. But will those issues impact the quarterly performance? Somit Sarkar is here to tell you more. Somit, over to you. Uh, good morning, Alex. So if you see, Interglobe Aviation is expected to report a steady quarter despite engine issues which led to cancellation of more than 900 flights in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018. Now, the revenue is expected to be up by around 26% to 6,127 crore rupees, while EBITDA, that is the earnings before interest tax and appreciation and rental costs is expected to be higher by around 14%. However, margins would take a downtick to around 25% versus 27.5% reported by the company in the corresponding period last year. Net profit is expected to be high by around 9% to 478 crore rupees. Now, the steady quarter is expected to be on the back of the modest growth in airfare strong passenger growth and a stronger rupee. Now, the passenger load factor, which is also known as the capacity utilization, averaged around 90% versus 86% in, in the last year. Now, the passenger growth was close to 24%, while airfares are expected to be high by around 3%, while rupee averaged around 
per dollar versus 67 per dollar in the corresponding period last year. Now, these positives will somewhat be offset by the rise in aviation turbine fuel prices. Now, the ATF price is higher by around 12 percent compared to last year. So, we can see a margin down, we are seeing a margin downtick because of that. Lastly, the company is also expected to be compensated for the losses related to the engine issues by the engine maker that is Pratt & Whitney. So, that could be a surprise factor for Indigo in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018. Now, things to watch out for would include management commentary on growth and yields, update on the induction of new aircrafts and new related engine issues, while guidance on fuel prices and future plans on long distance international routes will be a key thing to watch out for. Now, to answer your second question, that is regarding the untimely exit of Aditya Ghosh, well, for the company, it was not so sudden as Aditya Ghosh had earlier expressed his interest to exit the company, said Indigo's co founder Rahul Bhatia in an interview to Bloomberg Quinn. Now, adding to that, he also said that the company will have a smooth transition in leadership as Greg, Gregory Taylor comes in as a new president of the company. Rahul Bhatia also said that it is wrong to blame Aditya Ghosh for engine or customer issues that the company had seed, seen in the recent past. All right. That's, uh, it. Thanks so much for that, Somit. That's based on an interview that uh, Bloomberg Quint did, and you can log on to the website for a lot more on that story. But staying with earnings, HCL Tech is likely to report a steady fourth quarter driven by its IP partnerships. Net profit is likely to rise 2.5%, oh, while revenues in dollar terms are expected to increase 2.6% sequentially. Margins are expected to remain stable. Well, the key point to watch out for will be the new deals that the company has signed in FY18, which is likely to boost revenue growth. And the management commentary on guidance for the upcoming financial year will also be keenly awaited, particularly because of the headlines that some of its other peers in the sector uh, made when they gave their outlook for the new financial year. Investors will also be keen to find out about the company's acquisition strategy and their plans uh, from uh, their Mode 2 and Mode 3 businesses in the financial year that is ongoing. All right, to the big deal announcement that was made yesterday, l &T will sell its electrical and automation business to Schneider Electric. The 14,000 crore rupee deal uh, leaves uh, uh, leaves out marine switchgear and servo watch systems, and uh, in fact, all those details are with Darshan Mehta, and he's here. He's back to tell you all about that deal. Uh, Darshan, it seems like this has been in the works for some time. They've been wanting to sell this division. Yeah, the management's been very uh, open in indicating that they want to exit, exit some of the non-core businesses and focus on their mainstay, which is uh, infrastructure and EPC construction. So that is something that you know uh, was known. Uh, the deal valuation is close to 14,000 crores, and two units uh, will not be sold, as you mentioned. Now, basically, what's the rationale? It wasn't contributing significantly to the revenues. If you're looking at you know uh, the financials of the ENA division, now if you're looking at it for the last four quarters, uh, from the fourth quarter last year, it's fallen from almost 1,700 crores. The top line has fallen to almost 1,300 crores. No doubt, they've managed to maintain the margin, and the order book is pretty much stable in that level. So, wasn't contributing enough. or was close to five percent of the top line. Even if you're looking at what happened in the last three years, uh, if you're looking at the first nine months itself, they've done revenues of almost 3,900 crores. This is compared to a revenue of almost 5,400 crores, which they did in the earlier two years. So they, no doubt they managed to improve the margin, but the revenue contribution was simply not coming in. Basically, uh, the overall contribution for the past few years has been to the tune of almost fallen from 6% to close to 5% here. So wasn't doing much uh, well for LNT, and the management was trying to get, uh, you know, uh, wanted to exit this company, so now they have found the suitor, potential suitor. In terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, that's the maximum. Uh, almost 45% uh, of the top line for LNT comes in from the infrastructure space, and that is where they want to fo focus in. What the management says is that the ENA division doesn't fit in with the long term strategy of the company, and they want to focus in on the core business going ahead. As far as valuations are concerned, uh, it's pretty much uh, in, uh, it's slightly lower than what uh, the industry leaders, Siemens and ABB, have done. So, on, uh, as for JP Morgan, on an FY19 uh, EV to EBITDA basis, LNT ENA will get a valuation of 19 times compared to 26 times that Siemens does, and ABB does almost 20 times. So, uh, it's a decent valuation that they have got, gotten, but uh, doesn't move the needle much. Now, they need to. Now, the, the street wants to know what the management will be do with the proceeds. They have significant amount of debt on the books. If that is actually cleared off, uh, then you know it could be significantly uh, positive for LNT going ahead. All right, Darshan, and we do have uh, a comment from the management that we want to show our viewers. Listen into what they had to say. 
Schneider, as you all know, is a 24.7 billion euro organization. And it's one of the best companies to house this business of ours. Uh, it's been an integral part of Larsen and Tubro, but as we move forward on our path of infrastructure construction, EPC, manufacturing, defense, and certain services, uh, we feel this business does not fit into a long range uh, thinking. Business also requires a fair amount of R&D spend, uh, tooling, and such other factors to keep it uh, positive and moving. So we believe Schneider is a good company to handle that, to take it forward. As such, we have been over the years moving into more into the infrastructure construction, EPC, uh, the, the big product manufacturing and the services kind of organization. That would be the core as we move forward. All right, clearly, we'll have to watch out for LNT and the street's reaction to that particular deal. But let's talk about the other stocks in news, and Shraddha Babla is here <laughs> with an entire list to tell you. Well, Shraddha, morning. Good morning, Alex. I'm going to start off with earnings that came post-market hours. Uh, uh, so you have Dabar's strong set of numbers. Revenues grew by 6%. At Pat growth came in at 19%. EBITDA margins also expanded by about 200 basis points. And the domestic volume growth uh, came in at 7.7%. So good set of numbers there. Hindustan Zinc was uh, broadly in line with expectations. Revenues were flat. Net profit was down 18%. And EBITDA was down 3% at 3620 crores. But um, that was in line with estimates. But uh, a no final dividend could be a disappointment for Hindustan Zinc. You have Seat, which posted a good set of numbers. Revenues grew by 14%, net profit up 17%, and operational profit EBITDA grew by about 50%. Alcon Castalloy, uh, also a good set of numbers. Revenues grew by 43%, net profit was up 62 and EBITDA uh, remained, um, or, or growth came in in line with the revenue growth at about 45%. A strong set of numbers coming in there as well. Uh, that apart, you had two suitors uh, upping their are um, of a price for Fortis Healthcare. You have IHH, which has raised Fortis Healthcare bid from 160 per share to 175 per share. And the Hero Munjals have um, up the investment into Fortis from about 15 crores to about 1800 crores now. Uh, apart from auto sales numbers, uh, you also have another news development on Mahindra and Mahindra. They will acquire up to 10% stake in Can uh, a Canadian company, Reason Aerospace Corporation, for about 6.6 .6 Canadian dollars. That's close to 35 crores. A small acquisition for that company. You have Moil, which has. Uh, <coughs> cut the ferro grade and fine prices by about 15%. Uh, then you have uh, an ET report which says that Max and Excide Life have been shortlisted for IDBI Federal Life Insurance stake uh, with the valuation likely closer to that 6,000 mark. So all of these companies will be in focus. Mastec has won a contract for UK Home Office Biometrics. That's according to Bloomberg News. And you finally have Methan Alloys which will set up... Um, a new ferro alloy plant in West Bengal and they've also said that they might consider buying stressed assets. So all of these names to watch out for, Alex. All right. That's, uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Shraddha. Well, that's most of what you need to know going into your Wednesday. For everything else, do log on to the website BloombergQuint.com. There's several stories over there. Up next on Bloomberg Quint Live is all you need to know. Thanks for watching.